Okay, so I'm really excited uh, that so many people came to this talk. Thank you very much for joining. And um, I would like to present here the open hardware project that we are doing, PS Lab, Pocket Science Lab. I will give it a round in a moment as well. And uh, yeah, I would like to share a bit of uh, what we did, what's our background, um, and uh, how we went to production. And I hope I get some questions from you guys. So we are really eager to help others also uh, produce uh, open hardware. So I can just hand this uh, round here for the pros right away. And um, yeah, I will just go through a few slides first. So um, the background of Pocket Science Lab is that uh, um, we developed th this together with the FOSS Asia community. I've lived for many years uh, um, in Vietnam, in Singapore, and China. So um, I have a lot of relationships. And we started FOSS Asia 2009 um, as an event inspired by FOSSTEM. Uh, because we thought like not so much is going on around us, so why not just make an event? And um, as it happens, people have ideas during events. So we started an organization on GitHub and we started to make like software projects, for example, for events that we could use ourselves so we can run an event more freely. So here are a few projects, a lot of things that we do. We're also in Google Sum of Code and uh, all kinds of programs. Um, please uh, check it out. And um, recently, in the last few years, we've become uh, more interested um, in hardware. So this is a friend of us. It's uh, Praveen Kumar from uh, India. And he joined the annual Force Asia Summit 2014. And he brought us a lot of small hardware gadgets uh, uh, that, yeah, we thought this is really cool. He is a physics teacher in India. He also runs uh, Science Hack Day in India. And he proposed to us, why not develop something for physics uh, students? And he had a hardware at that time, um, but the hardware wasn't open source. Um, it was a C lablet hardware. And uh, uh, he showed to us how um, he uses it with his physics student. And we said, OK, cool. Let's uh, um, further develop and like create new software that can be used with this hardware. But in order to get us really excited about this, if we could have open hardware, that would be so cool. Yeah? And um, so the conversation started uh, with the developer of C Lablet. And uh, um, yeah, we uh, got an agreement after like a year because like open hardware, people like asked all these kind of questions that they used to ask uh, for free and open source before. Oh, how can I make money? And I paid for this and I spent my time and this, right? So, so we found uh, ways to convince them. And uh, um, based on this first hardware, we developed um, the first version of the um, Arduino uh, Uno form factor PS lab. So it's not an Arduino Uno. Many people ask that. But we think like it's always good if you have, for example, a casing or something like that, and it's the same form factor, you can just uh, uh, use it with this device as well. OK, so that was the first uh, version. And then uh, we went to many events. Like we always come to Foster, but we also go to the Chaos Communication Congress. And uh, you see it's very dark there. Yeah, Foster is a very bright event for, for, for hackers and many developers. But like I don't know if some of you can identify here are some people, for example, this is Bunny Huang, um, this is uh, Ming Ting Wei from the Debian community, and, and they had a lot of uh, feedback um, on our uh, uh, hardware because I said, okay, it's all good, it's all working, but if you want to produce it, it's going to be super expensive. Yeah? Because, for example, the first versions that we made, um, they had um, components on both sides. Yeah? And this is just one step more in production. It's very simple. But like after we changed it, we could reduce the cost already by 25%. So that's pretty huge if you uh, go to large scale production. So the next form factor that we then had was um, following again. Why not follow Arduino so people can use the case? Um, and uh, this one also supported uh, now an ESP8266. So we have Wi-Fi now, um, but uh, we don't ship with Wi-Fi. You can solder it on the device so when it goes around you can see it. Um, um, reason here, for example, is in some countries it's more difficult to sell if you have um, uh, wireless components. Like let's say in Japan, um, you need certification and so on. And we just leave the slot and people can solder it. And for now, it's, it's good for us. Um, yeah, and many small enhancements um, plus um, four more digital pins that we added uh, so you can actually plug in um, uh, sensors into the device. So here's the roadmap. We started with C Lablet. 
Um, yeah, we made the first PS Lab hardware. Um, we developed a PS Lab desktop app also. Um, so we have uh, we have an app for Android as well. Um, so the desktop as app is um, a Python application, and the PS Lab Android app is uh, in uh, Java and Kotlin. And the future we want um, a web app as well. So this is how it looks like um, from the uh, top. And uh, yeah, so what's, what's the goal? Uh, usually the question comes, what is the difference to Arduino? What's the difference to um, Raspberry? So Raspberry, uh, I would say it's a computer. Um, like they try to make it very cheap, they try to make it as open as possible, accessible for everyone. Um, Arduino, um, I would say it's, uh, um, uh, yeah, you can build your own electronics with Arduino very easily. You can make your own firmware, um, make prototypes and so on. Um, our goal is science. So we want to enable uh, students, but like also professionals, um, to conduct scientific experiments. So um, it's not so much the goal that they, uh, uh, like, add different components and upload a new firmware. The device already comes with a firmware. Of course, it's free and open, so you can change it. You can upload your own firmware, you can upload your changes. But uh, maybe some people don't know how to do that. And right, we want them to start right away. Yeah? So um, what you do is you uh, um, plug in uh, different uh, um, cables here into these small into these small pins. There are many different pins and the device goes around. You can see on the back side there's a description. Um, and then you can use it, for example, as an oscilloscope or multimeter. I will show you some screenshots in a moment as well. So there is an array of useful controls and measurement tools. Um, the integrated components can be used by pins and functionalities can be accessed through the apps and of course you can make your own app. Um, the uh, communication is following the UART standard so um, if you maybe have an app um, it might be working already. And so this is how you connect it. Here you see an earlier version of uh, PS Lab so it's connected through the USB uh, then directly to the phone. And uh, this means we can power the Pocket Science Lab um, directly through the phone um, by, via uh, USB. And we can also get the um, data at the same time. On the left-hand side, you see uh, a screenshot from the app. So we have many different tiles on the app. And uh, behind each tile, there is an instrument. This is how they look like, for example. So on the left-hand side, you see um, an oscilloscope. So again, like you connect the two uh, wires, and then you can do your measurements and then get the output here in the oscilloscope. Here we have a power source, which is another instrument. Um, we have a multimeter, a wave generator. There's a logic analyzer, um, so all kinds of tools. Um, also, like each tool has a guide. Yeah, you can just like scroll up like this, and, and then there will be a guide with some information. Um, looks like this, so um, to get newbies started. Then the desktop app. So um, during the last year, uh, we focused on the Android app. Um, because the reason is, right, I mean, people have an Android phone, many people have it, they can just install it from the Play Store, from F-Droid, and can get started quickly and try it out. Whereas installing it on, an, uh, on a desktop, um, yeah, it's more difficult, yeah? You, you need to set up a server, you need to set up Python, and all these things, so we want to make it easier as well. It's our goal for this year. Um, have an Excel file, many universities and, and, and uh, schools still use Windows, unfortunately. But like, make it easy, open it up uh, more, um, so people can um, uh, use open source hardware. So, but there are already 50 different scientific instruments on the app, so has some good start as well. Here an overview what it can function as. Uh, this is already what we implemented. Um, so we also implemented a Lux meter. Um, yeah, it's cool because you can try out the app with a built-in um, uh, Lux meter that the phones usually have here on top, right? And uh, um, yeah, see how it works. And once you have the device, you connect the device and you can have, uh, for example, a sensor connected to the device. So just to be clear, the device doesn't have all the sensors built in. It can measure electronics. But you can plug in any sensor, like uh, that is the I squared C standard yeah, that uh, Arduino also uses. Yeah? So um, that can be plugged in and it should be working. Um, software stack, here's an overview. So, so for Python, we use the uh, Python Qt, 
and uh, yeah, Android is pretty standard. Um, move to Kotlin mainly, still a few Java components in, in there as well, and the PS Lab firmware is uh, also available. Okay, so hardware specs, um, I, I put this on here. It's a lot of text, always discouraged to lose a lot of text in uh, 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 presentations, but uh, people like it, right? Like, uh, uh, I mean, like people in the hardware community like it, yeah? Because they can see uh, what's on there and it gives them an idea uh, what is the range and so on. So recently, for example, we had some uh, discussions on the microcontroller uh, um, uh, forum. And I saw a lot of people coming over to the website and then checking it out. And then some people microcontroller said, oh, yeah, here I have this device for 300 euros. It's much better. Yeah. So w yes, of course, we want to increase the range. We want like, to expand and see what other cool things we do. We do. But right now, um, uh, we actually started to sell for 55 euros. So, uh, and that already includes uh, the tax in Europe. So, uh, right? so when you compare, compare like the same kind of uh, uh, level. So, four channel um, or oscilloscope, uh, many have only two channels. And uh, yeah, we're supporting I squared C, SPI, UART, um, I already mentioned that. And um, yeah, more hardware specs here, um, two um, mega samples per second. Um, Maybe so. I, I think I just leave this uh, uh, for now. You can uh, check this out in detail also on our website, PSLab.io. Okay. So, because we wanted actually to talk more about production here in this session. So, production, um, uh, yeah, it's. It's not easy. How many here in this room uh, have experience with production? Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, the question is, what kind of production? How many people have uh, experience with like production, like let's say batches larger than a thousand? Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, that would be good to get your feedback as well and to get to learn what you are doing. So, um, a few people here in the room already. So, um, it uh, was our first time that we, with Pocket Science Lab, that we produced hardware in a larger scale, and uh, so the project was already ongoing for nearly four years. And uh, we got a lot of feedback, so that was our uh, advantage. Um, here, for example, from the Fraunhofer Institute uh, in Germany, they told us that um, yeah, uh, to make some changes, for example, to make uh, the components a little bit uh, uh, further uh, uh, into the board, like not so much on the edge, and um, yeah, to use like different uh, um, soldering um, ways. So that uh, um, helped a lot, like uh, really with the details. And then uh, we had uh, one big advantage because we are based in Asia. We actually have people who speak Chinese. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, here is WeChat, and uh, yeah. Our main like uh, 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 event and the main operations are in Singapore, and in Singapore you have Indians, you have Malays, you have uh, um, uh, Chinese origins, and uh, Wita is a Singaporean who speaks Chinese. And at the beginning, uh, he uh, communicated or helped to us or to communicate also uh, in English, yeah, because for them it doesn't matter Chinese, English, all good. And um, yeah, and uh, yeah, it was. Uh, um, really interesting and I'm always like say why do they answer this and I, I don't understand it doesn't make sense so we went uh, uh, back and forth a few times and, and then he also like sometimes ask in Chinese and then we realized that actually the answer in English was completely different to the answer in Chinese yeah <laughs> really in detail so um, yeah I mean if you want to make large-scale production it's pretty good if you have somebody who can speak Chinese and um, well I'm always a fan of languages um, yeah, maybe you could like, for example, talk to, to somebody uh, in, in a university. It's always a good place. I don't know uh, if there are many Chinese students here in the university in Belgium, but uh, in Germany we have many Chinese students. So why not go there and ask them if they want to do an internship for you? Maybe like if you do hardware production, it could potentially save you a lot of money um, to help you with this and explain to you. And then here are some lessons learned. So. Uh, uh, and I thought it's unrealistic what the other team members thought. So they thought we just sent the bomb, we sent the details, we figured it all out, wh which components we want. We sent it over, two months later we get the components. Well, it's not like that, right? So creating a bomb and coordinating with producers is a full-time job. Yeah? It really can keep you busy. And then there are parts in reels and tubes and prices are different. 
So, um, I don't know, reels, yeah? Round and then tubes you can pull in and also depends, like they have different machines. So some machines can use sometimes just the reels or, or so. So when we actually checked out the prices, for example, for the chip, the difference can be one dollar. And that means a thousand dollars when you produce a batch of uh, 1,000 devices. So um, this was something that, uh, that we learned. Um, then expect components to become unavailable. Um, yeah, so right, we might use old components or uh, like that are not available anymore in, in China, but maybe there are many in the US or so. But when you produce in China, uh, usually it doesn't make sense to re-import from the US. Yeah, it would be very difficult and actually the Chinese always charge for imports. Again, so even if you export, they charge for imports. So any, anything that you import into China, you have to pay for it, um, even though you take it out later again. Yeah? It's very difficult for them uh, to do this. So um, then understand when they offer remanufactured. Yeah? Who has heard this term remanufactured? Yeah? Yeah? So we can, I, I didn't understand. So you have such a small component, and it could be a resistor, really small, like, you know, cents. Yeah, and they say remanufacture. How can you remanufacture it? So um, what they do is actually sometimes during production things can drop on the floor, or they could just be like you know lying around, and then they, they have a reel, and they really have somebody who, for example, puts it back into a reel manually. Yeah, even the component is just like you know a few cents, very cheap. So, um, but what happens then is that they could be broken. Maybe some broken components could uh, go in, and and that means maybe the whole device doesn't work, and you wasted all the money. Then um, uh, we had a problem with the micro USB uh, header. So, so here we have the micro USB, and uh, when you plug it in, there are different tolerances. So, um, uh, and uh, if they use a different tolerance than what you have in your Gerber file, um, yeah, that, that's pretty uh, uh, problematic because with the prototypes, we never had this problem. But we suddenly had this problem in, in, in production. We didn't know where it comes from, so we really got all the uh, uh, details from the different producers, and we saw that we have very tiny difference. Um, and uh, so what we had to do here was we actually had to get somebody manually to, to, to push it and solder it again. Yeah? Otherwise, it, it would go off with a micro USB. So check these kind of things with a, a producer. Um, then the female pen, uh, pin headers, they weren't straight. So um, yeah, here, for example, I have one that is not straight. I don't know. Maybe the front row can see that. Yeah, so it's not like uh, uh, fit in straight these headers. And uh, so what, what we uh, did the first ones, there was somebody who, who, who then made them straight manually. But then we just uh, um, built like a, a component on top so they could be straight. Yeah? So these are things like we, we don't know. We just think we, we sent our files there. We don't know. And uh, some PS labs didn't work to, due to reflashing uh, problems. So, um, yeah, so they have, um, you, you uh, flash the chip and then you, uh, uh, yeah, it should work, right? And you would think it's a standard. Everyone follows the standard and um, yeah, and then it's all good. But actually, it wasn't the case because uh, we used one device to flash it, and they used another device to flash it. And then, right, it didn't work. So expect this. Here is a screenshot, and um, you can see that is what remanufactured means. So in in the middle here, there you see like some uh, uh, parts that were broken, and we had actually two companies that we engaged. So whenever something went wrong, they wanted wanted to try to put it on the other one. Yeah. So that was good that they informed us uh, about this. Yeah. So don't always uh, think about finding the cheapest price. Please, please check if it's like you know, 20 times cheaper. That happens. Yeah. Then the other price, something can't be right. Yeah. So um, non-crucial components like resistors and capacitors that are already very low in price, just forget about the lowest price. If you think it's OK and if all the other uh, parts are OK, just follow, follow that one. And uh, yeah, be ready to anticipate extra charges while in production. So to get the pin header straight, we actually had to pay for the um, component that they built in order to make it straight, for example. So something might come up, and they will uh, charge for it. And uh, let them know how to test the finished product. I mean, we always test manually when we make prototypes, but how do you test large batches? So you should develop a test case, and the perfect way would be if you have actually um, like a, a male or female, whatever, for your device to actually test it.
yeah, for them. Like if one person tests it and another one. Yeah, and always know the public holidays. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, they have public holidays uh, a whole week in October. So that might, might uh, mean like uh, production stops for two or three weeks. Now is uh, Chinese New Year, production stops for a month. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, because they always need some time to get back into production. So um, and, and they don't tell that uh, they don't tell you that because in, in China they often live in you know in Chinese everything is in Chinese. Uh, yeah, they they don't think about it. Yeah, it's it's like uh, everyone should know. It's just like in their world. I mean, we're not working with a super high end uh, manufacturers that like you know have somebody they have offices all around the world. We're working with Chinese producers uh, in order to get a price that's acceptable. So, yeah. So this is a bit of the story, and I already received uh, the notes that we are uh, don't have so much time left but uh, what we are doing now actually we are doing open hardware um, I think here yeah, I don't have to talk so much about why we do it and what is our goal we want all the layers to be free there are many different ideas about it like my idea would be uh, it would be so cool if we could just send schematics around the world and just how we do it with 3d printers today in future we can uh, just produce boards somewhere and uh, we want to share our knowledge we want to learn from others what they do um, and uh, if we do open hardware, um, all this will be possible, right? I mean, we don't have to, we can save the environment, we can do many things, and with our device you can do many, uh, um, um, yeah, many experiments and so on. So now, after we have the board ready, we are selling the board already to the, um, to the interested uh, public, but the next step is to make tutorials, um, the next step is to see what else we can do with the device. Um, we use a microchip here. Uh, people said they would be interested in making the next version uh, uh, with ARM. We also have more uh, ideas to make, uh, for example, um, a gadget, uh, an EEG gadget to collect brain waves. Open BCI is an existing open hardware project already. We have uh, some people, they have like, some other ideas to make it. So this is, these are our next steps. And uh, what we want from you is feedback help us to make, for example, the desktop app better. Anyone doing Python here? Python, yeah? Yeah, if you're interested, please check it out. We need the, to upgrade to Python 3.7. We're also participating in uh, GSOC, and we have our own internship program. So if there are any students who would like to spend uh, some time, like either online, but you can also come to our um, office in Vietnam. We actually started an open source hotel. That's a completely different talk. Uh, so uh, who, if you would like to stay with us for some weeks uh, um, or have any other ideas, uh, you can come and talk with me. And yeah, do the usual stuff, solve issues, um, make YouTube videos or whatever you like, uh, um, uh, or just become part of the community. You can buy it on Seed Studio. It's a pretty um, uh, good sale at the moment because we were on Hacker Day the day before yesterday. And we, um, our largest market at the moment is Switch Science. If you want to sell in Japan, um, I can help you. Here at the event, there, there's Yutaka Nibe. Are you here? No, no, I, I met him earlier today. He could also give you feedback, and we are selling in more and more places. The next uh, uh, possibility to meet up is at our annual FOSS Asia Summit um, that happens always in the middle of March from 14 to 17 um, uh, uh, in Singapore. Um, yeah, and please join us. If you want to know more about the device, come also to our booth it's, um, here on the ground floor. And uh, yeah, you can check out a few of the sensors and so on that we have. Uh, um, we are thinking of making a, a, a complete box, still checking out what we p put into the box exactly. Yes, that was my last slide, so thank you very much. <laughs> One quick question. Yeah? What did you do? Uh, what did you use for schematic entering and layout and routing of the ports? Yes, uh, we use KiCad. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, it's pretty cool. It's like uh, developed. Uh, uh, some people are religious, like uh, about uh, just the same with uh, Vim and Emacs. Yeah, so they say, oh no, use another solution, use this and that. But KiCad works uh, well for us, and uh, everything is on GitHub, by the way. So you can just check out FOSS Asia and PS Lab. Um, here's also the QR code, uh, and um, yeah, it's it, it's good for us. Yeah, I mean, we have a few other people. They say they still use Eagle. It's free, but not open. Yeah, I mean, for free, uh, it's always, you know, in English, right? Uh, yeah, but you, you know what I mean, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.